Okay, thank you. <coughs> Good morning. How are you all? So did everybody do their reading? Write their papers? Do their assignments? All right. Great. Uh, I, I'll do a little recap of what, what we did uh, last week. Uh, any, first of all, any questions from last week? Any questions at all from last week? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, we, we were talking about uh, what, what makes a Presbyterian, what is a Presbyterian. We talked about where we got the word Presbyterian and uh, what's, what's required of a Presbyterian. What's required of a Presbyterian? To confess the faith, right? To trust the in Christ, promise to follow, live by Christ's example, and commit and, and uh, serve. Uh, when, when you become a member uh, as a, uh, for a letter of transfer or a reaffirmation of faith, uh, uh, who, who remembers what I do up front? You remember the question I asked? Who is your Lord and Savior? And you answer, do you promise to be a faithful, loving, and caring member of this congregation? If so, answer, I do. Welcome aboard. All right? Now, that's really what we're looking for. All right? Uh, by If you say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're confessing your faith, you're putting your, you've got your trust in Christ, and you're following Christ. Uh, to live by Christ's example. And those first four things there really are summed up. Who is your Lord and Savior? Uh, and then the commitment to attend, to be a faithful member. Uh, uh, when, when the kids join uh, on, on Easter Sunday, I think it's Easter Sunday, right? Yeah. When the kids join on Easter Sunday, uh, I'll ask them a little bit different uh, uh, set of questions than I do that somebody's already been accepted into the church. Uh, I, I, will you be a faithful member uh, following the tenets, essential tenets of the church uh, and, and, and some other questions similar to when you get ordained. All right, when we get ordained, we have 10 questions that get asked. The first nine are the same for everybody, whether you're a deacon, a ruling elder, or a teaching elder. The same questions. And the only one that changes is that 10th question, and that's specific to the office that gets held. But the first nine questions are exactly the same questions. Exactly the same questions. It would help if I turned my mouse on, right? Got everything else turned on, right? Okay. What what is the Presbyterian Church? What is the Presbyterian Church? Uh, do you remember what 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 kind of government do we have? Does anybody remember? Democratic. Representative democracy, right? Who who overrules, oversees, and rules? The session. The session. The session does everything, okay, except preach, pick the hymns, pick the prayers, right, and, and, and no, even communion, no, they can't, they can't do the communion, but, but they set the communion, uh, they can't preach, they can't pick the prayers, they can't pick the music, everything else, everything else in the church belongs to the session. No money can get raised unless the session approves it. No program can come in unless the <coughs> session approves it. All curriculum for Sunday school gets approved by the session. Uh, all mission outreach projects get approved by the session. The stewardship campaign gets approved by the session. All personnel decisions end up getting approved by the session except my call. And my call 
is the one that goes to the congregation, right? Remember that? I'm part of the presbytery. I serve you, but I'm a member of the presbytery. Uh, but everything else falls the auspices of the session. Nothing happens without their blessing. And if it does, it goes against the book of order. Session has the final say and the total say of everything that goes on. They oversee and they rule. Uh, yes, Don? What, what constitutes approval in your session? What constitutes approval? Mm -hmm. uh, a motion has to be made. Uh, a second has to be done. We follow Robert's rules, essentially. Robert's rules or something similar to that, that a motion gets made or a recommendation from a committee is made. The recommendation doesn't need a second, but a motion is made in, at the session meeting by an elder. It has to get seconded. Then it's opened up for the discussion amongst the elders. And then that vote takes place, and then that, that becomes the rule uh, for that given church as long as the moderator deems that it's not in violation of the Book of Order. A simple majority? It's a simple majority, yes. A simple majority. Everything is a simple majority except for the, uh, uh, a, a change in the bylaws. Change in the bylaws, gen we follow two-thirds rule, just like the uh, PCUSA does. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but it's a simple majority. Uh, it is even a simple majority to call a pastor, all right? If the congregation votes and it's a simple majority, the pastor won't take the call, okay? That's why the pastor generally asks, the incoming pastor will ask, what was the vote, okay? If the vote is 150 to 1, 150 yay, 1 nay, or 120 to Six nay, okay, but you get over that up uh, that percentage that 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 you're going to have trouble. That means you've got people that don't want you as the pastor because that's a really important piece. Uh, so you're going to have trouble. So even though it's majority, a simple majority, the, pr the pastor would probably not take that call. But in in the church governing. It's just a simple majority. And the one that breaks the tie, if it's, if it's in the session, is the moderator. And if it comes down to that, I would say let's refer this back to the committee to rework it and come back with something that uh, can be, can be, you know, can be uh, uh, agreed upon. And, and let's get all the parties together and talk about this. And so I would, I would ask for a commission to be uh, set up or a special subcommittee of session to be set up temporarily to look at, similar to what we did with the youth director, all right? We didn't have, uh, uh, we could have just let the personnel committee and the youth director committee, youth committee pick the youth director, but the session decided to create a commission in which there had to be uh, a unanimous vote uh, to call or, or hire that youth director. If that committee called the youth director and wanted to hire that youth director, it then went to personnel and then to me and, and me. Personnel looked at it and then made the recommendation to session to hire uh, the youth director, okay? Uh, they could have commissioned that committee to bring it back to session to vote. So the, but the session decides how all of that is going to work, okay? Uh, but but uh, each committee has their own responsibilities, but it's up to the duty of session to make sure that they believe things are being done decently and in order. It's the, uh, it's the duty of the moderator to make sure that we adhere to the book of order. So, uh, so C Christian Ed can't go in and say, well, for summer Bible, for vacation Bible school, we're going to do the Sparks program, and it's going to be the railroad uh, curriculum. Even though the committee unanimously votes, yes, that's what we're going to do. Uh, even though uh, the ex officio and pastor says, yes, that is outstanding, let's do it. Yeah, you have to make a recommendation to the session to approve the curriculum. 
you're responsible for teaching the folks in a reformed manner. And that's kind of what I look at when I look at the curriculum to make sure that it follows the reformed tenets. That's why the pastor has to be involved in that. Um, many people don't like that, that kind of involvement, but, but that's, that's really what my duty is ex officio, to make sure that things are not going to get out of hand. Um, uh, and, and I'm trying to think of the, the equivalent in the, uh, in the uh, Senate or the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, prob probably the majority leader uh, that, that sits, sits in the chair, uh, she has the power to, to do things. Uh, the Senate Majority Leader, the same thing. He, he can kind of keep things in order, uh, but the pastor doesn't have that kind of power to decide what's going to be done. It's really up to the committees and session what's going to happen. I just make sure that it's done decently and in order. Okay? Does that, does that answer your question? It does. Okay. But you established a form, and from that, then you say the majority vote is good. Sure. Uh, uh, standard, if there's no, uh, in, in, even it holds true for committees, uh, you establish what your committee is at the beginning of your first meeting. Uh, you establish that I have five members, okay, uh, on, the, on the committee, including uh, the, the chair of the committee, and they have full right to vote. So you have five. What's the simple majority? Three. Three, right? So even within the committee, the, if you don't have an unwritten rule, if you have a written rule that says something different, three is the number. If you don't have three people there, the, the actions that that committee takes, it's null and void. The only way you can get around that is the chairperson brings it to session without the committee doing its work. And it can be that that can be done. A lot of a lot of uh, a lot of committees work that way. A lot of churches work that way. The committee does the work, or the session does the work of the committee. That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Let you have to trust that your committee chair, your elders, know what the heck they're doing. And, and it really is important. I think it's really important uh, that that uh, there's certainly discussion <coughs> that can be made and had at the session meeting. But that's, that work should be done at the committee level to iron out details. Because if the session says, yeah, well, I think we ought to do group uh, curriculum, uh, Rome. Well, that's the curriculum they're going to use. Who's going to do it? And would you, would you stay a member of session? Probably not. Your, did your committee do the work? No. So who's going to do it? Not session. They can make that decision, but that's really silly. Okay, uh, there there are some things that the session can't do. They can make a recommendation of salary for me and the, for the terms of call. My contract is only a year by year thing. Every October, you renew my call. That's why we do it in October because it has to be decided by December. All the all the budgetary stuff I have to submit my housing allowance and, and that sort of stuff. And, and it has to be posted by the session that this is what it's going to be. But the congregation decides that. The session does not. Personnel will look at the numbers, make a, make a decision and say, this is what we think it will be, and bring it to the session. The session says, okay, well, let's, let's lift it up to the congregation. And the congregation makes the vote. That's why I'm not there, just like my call. I'm not there. Janie or the clerk takes over the meeting and, dis and leads that meeting to decide whether or not you're going to call me again for the year and pay me. Do you approve the budgets as a congregation? What do you think? Yeah. No. <laughs> Trick question. Yeah, no, the, the, the congregation does not vote on the budgets. That's a session responsibility. Now, if the session is smart, they listen to the congregation. How do they do that? By their pledges. 
They speak with their pledges. Okay? If the congregation says, this is a, this is a crazy budget, no, we're not going to do that, and withhold their pledge, well, session has to make a decision what to do. So session has to be smart on that. But the session is totally responsible for everything but me. Are anybody surprised at that? You did. It's a smart session. They're, you're all in bed with them then. So they, chose they chose to do that. They, they, and, and they don't have to live. That budget's already approved at the, at the November session meeting when we say this is what we're going to present to the congregation. Notice that they didn't say for you to. Uh, they approve the budget. You're, you're just adding your. Uh, stamp of approval onto it, okay? They approve the budget, not the congregation. But the, what they're doing is getting the congregation involved to say, do we hear any noise? Do we, is there any noise in the congregation? So if somebody says, hey, I, th I think, uh, I think uh, your operating expenses are way out of line, uh, you need to cut all your employees except for Tim. And, uh, and if somebody makes a motion at that January meeting, it can be taken back to session and they discuss it. Does session have to agree with it? No. There's only been a couple times where I've seen sessions say no to a motion because they trust the work of the committees. So uh, 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 any, is that OK? All right, any other questions about that? That's really. Would it justify having been a long time Methodist and the Loyola staff there when you were a Methodist church? This involves the congregation far more heavily than any other group that I'm aware of. I, I think it's, it's a pain in the neck and one of the ones that's absolutely necessary for getting the church involved in managing the church. It, I, I agree. 100%, Don. Uh, it, sometimes it's a real pain in the rear end. It really is. But when the decisions are made, we know that we've done our due diligence. And I, I believe uh, for the health of the denomination and for the health of the church, doing that due diligence is really important. Um, you know, like hi hiring that youth person. Yeah, we took a long time to do that. Could we have done it quickly? You bet. We did our we did the due diligence and we put some things in place to make sure that that everybody on the committee agreed. All it took was one person to say no. Just like your PNC. It could have been one person that said, No, I really don't don't like him. He doesn't have enough hair. <laughs> and the, it you know Actually, he, it, was it was the sunglasses, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and later, later came the socks. But uh, yeah, but uh, uh, but but when you structure committees to let them do the work, you have to trust that the Holy Spirit is doing that work. That's why each meeting is opened up with prayer. Each meeting is closed with prayer. Uh, and did we open up this meeting with prayer? I don't remember if we did. Probably not. Well, golly gee, we haven't really not opened it up yet. We're recapping. Uh, after this slide, I'll I'll let we'll pray because that's the new that'll be the new curriculum. Uh, any other questions though from last week? So last week's prayer covers right now. Yeah, Bev. Oh, oh, okay. All right, all right. All right. We we have uh, there is a group called the deacons. We used to have deacons in this church, right? Yeah. I. Uh, what we've done is uh, created a unicameral board, and the session acts as not only the trustees, the deacons, and the se but they also act as uh, deacons as well. I, I consider congregational care and the seekers committee to be the deacons to do that do that kind of work. At least that's what I see 
in the definition and the work of those committees. I also see a little bit of it in mission outreach, <coughs> but, uh, but they're, the deacons do the in-house stuff, all right? Mission outreach does the outreach, okay? Doesn't mean that they can't do in-house stuff, but deacons do the in-house uh, uh, ministry, preparing meals, uh, visiting hospitals, visiting the sick, uh, handing out, you know, doing that kind of stuff inside, meeting the needs of the congregation. <clears throat> and then the trustees, every church has to have a board of trustees. And in this church, uh, the session is elected as the trustee, right? Yes, Roberta. Oh, sure. The session? No, really, the session does. Uh, uh, th this, the First Presbyterian here is a little unique uh, in that they've got such a big session and don't have those deacons. That's pretty unique. Um, uh, your property committee is huge. Uh, could they be trustees? Yes. Um, but I, I think it's, it's right here. Uh, there, there's a church up in Philadelphia uh, that the session, and you ready for this? 42 people. Oh, can you imagine? I can't. I, can't I, I couldn't imagine being the moderator of that. Right? And then they have deacons on top of that. Of course, their membership is humongous, yeah. and they've got gazillions uh, of dollars that are in play. They had the Pew Family Charitable Trust. Uh, they had uh, the Wanamaker Trusts. Uh, they had. Uh, they have the current ownership of the Phillies. I mean, I mean big, big numbers. So, uh, but they've got lots of people. Uh, so you need you need that. So you might have four people, five people sitting on Christian Ed, each one responsible for a little piece of that. Worship, you have uh, four or five people on worship just doing that. And they normally will elect a chairperson, but there's a lot more committees, okay, than what we've got. <coughs> Our governing bodies, session, then we have a presbytery, then we have a synod, and then we have general assembly. Any questions about this slide? This really is the meat of being Presbyterian right now without talking about essential tenets and doctrine and that sort of thing. Any questions? Let's pray. Yep, what's Don? Yep. Oh, yeah. Understanding who your trustees, who your committee chairs are, and keying in. If you have, if, if, if there's something to do with them, it's essential to key that in so that the chairman understands what you're up to. But there are other things that there's a finance mechanism, there's the, the members of the church, it, it, it's representative in nature. And so if Right. Every, every committee meeting and session meeting, <coughs> the elders will tell you <coughs> that, that when it comes to my report, my part of that committee meeting, <coughs> excuse me, I ask the question, what can I do better? <coughs> Is there anything that I can do better? Is there anything that I should not be doing? <coughs> uh, is there anything uh, that, that I need to stop doing? I haven't had anybody come up to me yet. And that's not good. That's not good. Because I know that I'm not perfect. I know it. And then, uh, you know, and wait for a year. Uh, you know, Tim knows every Sunday. 
uh, we we kind of meet and you know Sunday service went well blah blah blah, uh, but but the feedback is really important from the congregation. What Don said, it 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 keeps us from having to put out fires before they become blazing. So if you don't like yes. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not clear on who represents us and I, how I, 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 I don't know who in heaven is going to have to answer for the things that we do. Okay. We, we have, well, I'll tell you what, since we're, that, that really is starting to get into uh, the next set of bunch of slides. So let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we know that we, we've jumped right in because we're excited about studying what you want us to be. And yes, you want us to be Presbyterians, at least in this room. We're not studying your text, but everything that we do relates back to your text. Yes, we're not studying your confessions, but it all relates back to those confessions. We pray, Lord, that the spirit that rests in our hearts, each and every one of us, that it activates in our minds, bodies, and souls so that we might get a glimpse of understanding of how you might use us to further your kingdom. And make no mistake about it, it is your kingdom. This is your church, and we are your people. And it's in your son's name that we do and say all things. Amen. Okay, the the, uh, general assembly, uh, let's talk about Presbytery first. Presbytery meets two times a year here at St. Augustine. Uh, I go once a year, and we have one other representative from session that goes. Normally, it's Janie Killian and I that go. Uh, uh, But uh, in two years, we'll be allowed to have two elders go along with me. But the pastor is always offset by a layperson. Always balanced, always balanced. There should be equal representative in, at the presbytery of elders and ministers of the word and sacrament, ruling elders and teaching elders. There should be a balance. That way, nothing gets out of whack, uh, favoring one side or the other. It gets pretty contentious at presbytery meetings. Who's been at a presbytery meeting? That's why I only go once. <laughs> uh, oh, and talk about Robert's rules. Holy moly. Uh, th- they've got people there that just love the detail of Robert's rules. So, yes, Roberta. Yeah, we have two boats, me and a, and another person, but I could bring all of you. Yeah. Sure, sure. Joan Joan comes with me. Yeah, yeah. She'll you know they'll listen. Um, uh, many churches bring uh, members from their session because they've never been to a, a presbytery meeting. Uh, they'll bring their new elders. Um, I love our representative democracy, but I hate getting bogged down in detail of this motion needs to be seconded and then amended, and then the amended needs to be amended, and the second then amend, uh, the amendment that comes down. Well, I'll tell you, we spent at the last presbytery meeting, we spent probably an hour and a half hour and a half on a simple me- a simple recommendation from a committee to look look at the position of executive presbyter. All they had to say was, yeah, let's look. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no. Oh, no. It was like we were hiring a uh, uh, You just can't get bogged down in in the details. 
There are many sessions, though, that get bogged down in Robert's rules. I try, at least from my standpoint, I, I try not to do that. I let, I let the committee kind of do it. Sometimes it drives some folks crazy that there's a lot of talking, but I could control that by using the, f the details. Oh, it uh, makes my hair stand up, whatever little hair I've got. Yes? At least two, yes. I in 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 Saint Augustine, no. Uh, although uh, I have seen a couple churches that have more than one, so that could be size. Uh, I know up in the Philadelphia Presbytery, that it's based on the size of your church as to how many elders you have. That's not good because that puts the small church at the disadvantage. St. Augustine doesn't do that. What they do is they alternate who gets more elders to vote. And there's about eight churches at a time, I think, that get uh, maybe 12 churches at a time that get additional representation. All right? Uh, it may have been used to be like that, but that's not the way that it is now. They, they, because it gets out of balance. That would mean uh, that, that uh, uh, Memorial Church, for instance, has four elders. They would drive everything. Uh, Jacksonville, uh, some of the big churches in Jacksonville, or what is it, Second Press, First Press, whatever it is, but they'd have six elders. They, they, and they, they stack the deck when you do that. Uh, so uh, what St. Augustine has done is level the playing field for the small churches, a well-born has the same vote as we do, has the same vote that Amelia Island's got, has the same that, is, uh, that, that Gainesville has, we, unless it's, you're in one of the 12. Yes? Yes and yes. Like I yeah. Tropical sure. Like yeah, there's a tropical. Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, uh, w a west coast. I think it's called. What's the Tampa, St. Pete? Uh, uh, and then we have the one over in Tallahassee that Roy Martin is uh, is the uh, uh, exec at. And then you have St. Augustine. St. Augustine, from a geographic standpoint, is the, one of the biggest presbyteries around, other than Montana. But who, who decided that some of the geography uh, it, it Early on, it was decided, like, for instance, we talked about last week, that uh, the first presbytery was organized in Philadelphia. Right. And then, uh, and that encompassed a big area. Well, in Philadelphia, there's actually uh, two presbyteries, okay? They split Philadelphia Presbyteries. Gets just it just gets too big, uh, and they, and you can't do anything. So they split the presbytery up uh, from a geographical standpoint at the main line, and south of the main line it was Philadelphia Presbytery. North of it uh, is uh, um, I can't remember the name, but but you once you start getting too big. You, you have to break it up, all right? Uh, but the same thing holds true for the Synod. It's geographical. It's geographical. Uh, but, but you have to wonder, how, you, know, you have to be careful how big it gets. Uh, it, it becomes, uh, St. Augustine, in my opinion, is almost too big geographically to be doing what it's doing. And one of the ways that they're go, uh, getting around that is they've, broke up, they've broken up into quadrants. And we have, uh, we have four people, four retired pastors that kind of uh, are, are not in charge, but kind of the point people right. for those quadrants. Uh, ours is Don McGarity, and he preached for us once. Right. Don, Don is our representative, if you would, and he, he, he makes sure the pastors are, are in tune, that if any problems are going on, we can talk to Don. And Don then can go to the, count, the general council, uh, the, com the 
the board and bring up our issues. Yeah. Uh, so we've kind of broken it up. We've made it a little bit easier. We've made it easy to a little bit easier to uh, become a pastor as well. Uh, we've we've kind of modified some of our committees. Uh, we've followed some of the presbyteries around the country that have done this, organized a little bit differently to make it more fluid uh, and give the committees more uh, more power, as opposed to having the whole body have to vote and you end up spending 12 hours at Presbytery uh, to examine, for instance, uh, I didn't have to stand in front of Presbytery, I had to stand in front of a committee, okay? Which was really a, a blessing and a curse. <laughs> uh, the blessing was that it was a committee. The curse was it was a committee. Uh, you know, the, but if you've ever, you know, if, uh, it's called final trials when a pastor when a pastor comes into a presbytery and or to be ordained they go to final trials and what it used to be is that you had to stand in front of the entire body of presbytery and they could exa they would examine you tell me what your thought is on predestination and how does that fit with faith and how does that uh, and and you can't sit there and say well can we answer that one at a time can't you have to answer that question and they can ask crazy questions depending on what the the issue of the day is so and they did, and they did yes uh, yeah what what do you have trouble with well i have trouble with this well tell me explain that to me you know and i answered the answer the question well that you know that's not it i said that's why it gives me trouble Anyway, so uh, so that so yes, uh, presbyteries uh, are are equally represented here in Saint Augustine, uh, geographic for the most part. Uh, could we could I have could we have another presbytery here in Florida? Probably. It's pretty. It, this is a pretty big state, uh, and we have a lot of churches. Um, but but I don't want to get involved in that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm happy being pre pastor at First Presbyterian, doing my thing. Yeah, the general assembly. General assembly. Okay. Well, let uh, session. We got the session right. They do their thing at the church. Session then sends a representative and the pastor to presbytery, and they do their thing. Right. Same kinds of things that we do here. Right. Okay. Uh, then it goes. Then there are a number of presbyteries that make up a synod. Okay. Uh, it, so it makes it a little bit easier to, to manage. And then the General Assembly. General Assembly meets twice, but once every two years, and they, they vote on the overtures. And we're going to get into that piece here in a couple slides. General Assembly looks at the Book of Order, looks at the Book of Confession, and makes sure that we're, if there's any changes that need to be made, normally there's hundreds of them, uh, that, that get brought up and have to be discussed and voted on. Some are big, some are not so big. Voted on by, voted on by representatives get, get, that get sent from the presbyteries. Okay? okay? Out of the presbytery, uh, like St. Augustine has, I think it's five representatives. Okay? Uh, two pastors, two ruling elders, and one uh, of the governing body, like the clerk, all right, Sandra Hedrick, two elder, two ruling elders, two teaching elders, so it's kind of offset even then, all right, um, and so they all meet, and it's a, it's they meet in this big arena, and you break off into all these different commit subcommittees to discuss your particular piece of the book of order, and any change or program that you want to bring forward. But Synod does the same thing as Presbytery, just at you know, a bigger geographic area. Uh, but uh, Presbytery sends representatives to that. Yes, Joan. Uh, you, are, you put your name in a hat, and you answer a bunch of questions. 
and then your name is brought forth in front of presbytery, and they vote on you. Uh, normally, they're looking, they're begging for people to go. Uh, it gets a two-week commitment in the middle of the summer, and uh, you know that's it's it's quite a commitment that you've got to make. Um, if I was up in Philadelphia, the, the General Assembly meets this summer up in Baltimore. Man, I'd have had my hat, my hand in the hat, you know, man, my hat in the ring. I'd love to go to that. But it's a lot of hard work. And, and pray that you don't get on one of those controversial committees. Oh, baby. But you also have committees that if you are elected, you, you can be elected to a General Assembly committee on peacemaking, or missions, or finance. I mean, and you, can you imagine having to travel to California to go to your meeting? So, the churches and the presbytery. Yeah, because you call, you call, remember, you call me to serve you, but part of my, part of the gig is that I'm supposed to serve at presbytery and do do things at Presbytery. Uh, uh, so if I'm if I'm elected to a position, you folks, we gotta you got to fund it. Uh, there's not a pot that all Presbyterians take. Well, part of part, the yeah, they part of it does, but the churches have to pay for that. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How many people go from each presbytery? It, 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 it generally runs, depending on how big your presbytery is. It, it's just predetermined uh, uh, based on your size. Uh, I think it's two elders, two ruling elders, two pastors, uh, and then an exec or the clerk. That, I think that's what, that's what, uh, we, that what we send. Um, Philadelphia will br bring a little bit more that's based on size. Uh, some will bring a little bit less. Um, but it's, it's at the presbytery level. It's not at the synod level. Those people that are at synod will maybe belong to committees, and they go to the presbytery because they sit on those committees. They go to the General Assembly because they sit on those committees. And we're, we're, we're going to get to that in two slides. We'll kind of we'll make that a little bit easier. Yes, Jenny. Yes. Yes. And other people can go. Yes, absolutely. In fact, they, they recommend it. Uh, if, you, if, like, for instance, it was in Philadelphia in 1976, and they invited all the choirs to come and, and participate in the worship service, the opening worship service. It was so cool. Oh, it was so cool. I mean, you have thousands of choir members. Can you imagine? Uh, you know, Mormon Tabernacle Choir was probably half the size of what was what was there, and having those voices, uh, it was it was it was incredible. But you had elders and sessions sitting kind of in the in the upper deck, because it was in the uh, where was uh, where was that? Um, it was in the big basketball arena, uh, the Spectrum. It was at the Spectrum. And the upper level were guests, kind of like the Senate. You, you, can, you can visit the Senate, but you sit up in the upper deck, all right? Uh, but on the floor are all the representatives. Also pretty slick to watch all that in motion. Uh, uh, but uh, to be on those committees, oh, Lordy. Whew. Ooh. Tough, it's a tough job, uh, but it's a job that's required. It's a job that's needed, and, and you'll see why here in a little bit. Yes, Roberta. Yes. Their funds come from us, the churches. It's called the per capita. It's like a head tax, all right? They say uh, that every member 
uh, of the presbytery has to pay 30 bucks. Uh, the, set, the, the, the church has to pay 30 bucks for each member, okay? And that 30 bucks then is divided between presbytery, synod, and general assembly, okay? And based on that budget that gets submitted by general assembly, that gets submitted by synod, that gets submitted by presbytery, they determine that to do your al our allocation, they need X number of funds. So it could be 30 bucks. So that's why it's important. Absolutely. You, yes. You need that. That's when we, when we, uh, for me, it would be great just to have uh, 50 members and everybody else as visitors <laughs> or affiliates. All right. You don't have to pay any head tax on them. But that, they don't have any votes then. All right. So. Uh, so it, it comes with a double-edged sword, uh, but that, that's how it happens. If you're a member, but if you've got dead wood in your membership, roll on your rolls. You got to keep those rolls clean. Yeah, yeah, and and we've done a really good job over the last last few years to get rid of it. You know why, oh, Pastor? You're not doing a very good job. Our membership keeps dropping. Because we had a lot on the rolls that were dead, roll, dead. Sure, I don't want to take my membership, yeah. right? Will they ever be back to vote? Probably not. But what we could do is you can move them to inactive, take them off the rolls, and you don't have to pay the head tax on them. All right. Now, is that ever audited? I mean, like, how do they they trust you as people, right? It, yes, we're a church. We we're supposed to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why if you can't pay? Why if your church can't pay? Is There's a lot of churches that can't. They it just they go into a deficit, or the other churches have to make up the difference. Make up the difference. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So the, so the presbytery has to pass a budget, and that's what we did the last meeting, is we passed the budgets for the for this this year. Huh. So. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion going on about how we're going to spend our money. It, Camp Montgomery falls under under that. So uh, that that's a big expense. Uh, and how we're going to keep that, try to make that self-sufficient. Well, that's going to be tough to do if it has debt and needs a lot of work. It's like coming into a church that needs a lot of work and might have a mortgage. You know the membership is going to have to dig really deep in order to get that church back at a level, level playing field. So, any other questions? Yes, Jerry. What role does church discipline play? Okay, well, uh, church discipline uh, is is done at a session level, a presbytery level, a synod level, and a general assembly level, and it's called a judicial committee. Uh, what if if there was something that happened? Here, what we would do is we would call a judicial commission, and we would have a member of the council of presbytery moderate that. Uh, they they would kind of act like uh, Justice Roberts did for the impeachment trial. Okay, uh, the session would sit like the Senate did, and then you'd have other people sitting around on the other side. Uh, th that's only formed under grievous situations. Um, I've only been involved in a judicial committee twice in all of my ordained years, and that's a long time. Um, but if there's, uh, uh, normally it doesn't get that far it, to go on trial, because that's what it is, it's a trial. But it's, there's a book of discipline in the book of order, it's D, discipline, uh, remember early on we said what are the marks of the church to preach the word rightly right administer the sacraments and what's the third one exercise discipline okay okay any other questions okay what do we believe yeah I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth uh, there's no set of beliefs that separate us from 
all the denominations. What is the basis of being a member of the Presbyterian Church? Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. As long as that's professed, you are good all the way around. Now it's going to talk about some baptism stuff and all that. You have to be baptized again or not baptized or blah, blah, blah. But do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes. Uh, uh, do you believe that God is omnipotent? Yes. All the denominations believe that God is omnipotent. And God created the universe. That Jesus Christ was the incarnate God on earth. In other words, the Son of God. That the Holy Spirit is presence in God in the world. Holy Spirit is the presence of God in the world. In other words, what do we have right there? We have the Trinity, right? The Trinitarian nature of God. Everybody believes that. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Uh, well, uh, the Roman Catholics, uh, they go to confession, and who do they confess to? The priest. Who absolves them of their sins? The priest. Uh, do I absolve you from your sins? Who absolves you from your sins? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and how did that happen? Jesus dying on the cross. That's the saving act. Now, we're going to get into that uh, maybe two weeks. What is, is. Uh, it just depends on how, how things go today. But, uh, but that, that's going to be a great class to understand kind of those dynamics, the be difference between the Reformed tradition and Roman Catholicism. Okay? Uh, but it all starts with what you call that person standing in front. I don't offer a sacrifice. I don't absolve you from your sins. What do I do? I preach the word, I serve the meal, I, I, I serve it, all right? I offer it up, the elders then take that meal, act as waiters and waitresses, and serve it. That, that's, we'll get into that, all right? And that the church, yes, yes. Yeah, that 70 years ago, yes, I believe it. Yeah. What, what, what was happening 100, 275 years ago? Yeah. What, what was happening? You had the Protestants versus the <laughs> Roman Catholics, right? There was a lot of discord. Uh, and that, that held true not just for Ireland, for instance. That held true everywhere, and it has held true since 1500s. There's been a lot of discord because of we think they're heretics, they think we're heretics. But the universal question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? You can answer that question in the affirmative, and you promise to be a faithful member, welcome aboard. Uh, th that Dr. Mott would not have done that. His conditions were different. His book of order was different. And... The, the culture was also different at, the t at that time. Um, that it, your situation wa was not unique. Uh, to, to marry outside of your denomination was bad. I mean, you know, even to worry if, if Mike were to have married a Presbyterian, you don't believe the same way, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and conversely. But in Roman Catholicism, 
you have to promise to bring your kids up, all right? Because the marriage, the marriage is a sacrament, okay? We only have two, all right? Roman Catholics have seven. Marriage is one of those. So if the marriage is a sacrament, you have to make a covenant with God. And what's that covenant? That you're going to bring your kids up in that tradition, that you're going to attend that church, that you're good. It's, it's almost a condition of membership. All right? So to, and then conversely, do you believe that the Pope is the ultimate word? Yeah, I mean, if you're Roman Catholic, yes. The papal law. If you're Protestant or Reformed, who, who has the final law? God. Uh, do, does, do I have the final law? No, I keep hitting that microphone. Sorry about that. Uh, the final ruling takes place in the people. But at the, at the Roman Catholic Church, it's the priest that kind of has the last say, but it all goes up to the Pope, and the Pope says, this is going to be, it's going to be. Yes, Debbie. I'm married to a Catholic. Okay. She didn't. She didn't really. She didn't mean that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, and that's and it. And that, but but yes. Yeah. Oh sure. Oh well, we're gonna we're gonna get into that. Yes. Yeah. That's why Martin Luther broke broke away. That was one of the things. One of the, one of the reasons why. Give him money. Sure. Uh, but but. You, the church has to be involved if if it's if you're breaking a covenant and you're you're breaking a sacrament the church has to be involved in that somehow the priest has to unravel that and that's how they unravel it signing papers making new pledges and offering enough indulgence and we call that's what we call indulgence offering the indulgence to help annul that so yes, yes, but but it's because it's a sacrament, all right. Any other questions? Any other questions? What's that? For, forgiveness of sins. We believe that our that our sins were forgiven on the cross. All Christian denomination, all of them believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Okay. Church is universal. It belongs to God. The Holy Spirit's present. Jesus is there. God created everything. And the life everlasting. There's a resurrection. After we die, where do we go? There's a resurrection. Okay? So life everlasting. Now, remember the Apostles' Creed, that very simple thing that we say on Sundays. Um... That, that really is the universal creed that was used in the early church for everybody. And then they decided to come up with the Nicene Creed, which is a little bit more difficult. And then, they st and then we started to come up with Westminster and the Shorter Catechism and the Longer Catechism and then the Barman Declaration. And then, we, you know, and we started to, man, make things all kinds of complicated. The Apostles' Creed, simple, <coughs> sweet, and to the point. And that the Bible, and here we, we, it, it's inspired, okay? Bible is inspired word of God. It is inspired. Everybody believes that, but how it gets interpreted, that's a different ballgame, okay? Uh, now, the Bible is the inspired word of God written by humans. It's either infallible or it's living. And we aren't getting into the, into the, to that.
We're not going in that rabbit hole. No way. All right, with that, let's, let's take a five-minute break. Let's take a five-minute break.
All right. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we get started again? Where where do we uh, where do we find our inspiration? We just talked about the last item. We get our inspiration. Everything that we do is found in the yeah. as the inspired word of God. We call it that it was revealed by God to humankind or the revelation of God, not the book of Revelation, right? Not, not, not that book. It's called God revealed and therefore the revelation of God. And we then consider the Bible to be double-edged, why do we consider the Bible to be double-edged? Because of the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? The Old Testament has 39 books. In our Bible, in the Jewish Bible or the Tanakh, in the Tanakh, they have 24 books. The same books, it just they're just combined. They're combined. The Old Testament, uh, the Tanakh, the Tanakh was completed and approved by something called the Great Assembly in 450 BCE. And it, BCE, before the Common Era, it used to be called BC, before Christ. BCE, before the Common Era. That's the, that's the uh, terminology that we use now. Okay, and instead of AC after Christ, it's called CE, right? Common era. What? No. Nope. You don't have this slide yet. Nope. And in fact, you don't have the rest of these slides here. You better take notes. You, so, what? What? I, I, there's still going to be a quiz. That's right. All right. So. It, th 39 books, but it's broken up into sections, and and it's called in in the Greek. It's called the Pentateuch. Penta. Five, five books. What are those five books? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Right, the Torah, the Torah. Then we have the historical books. Then we have the wisdom literature. Then we have the prophets. And those prophets are, are broken down sometimes to major prophets and minor prophets. Not because of the quality, it's because of the quantity. The minor prophets are shorter books, the major prophets are much, much longer. Isaiah is five books, for instance, right? And then you have, uh, and I, I think most of you who have study Bibles will have this. I, I always like to include uh, in the study Bible, I'd like you to, I always like you to get the Apocrypha. Uh, the Apocrypha is appended to the canon. It's not included as the regular books. Okay? Again, that was completed in 450 BCE. And then the other side of the sword, the other side, not the sword, but it's double-edged, the Old Testament, and you have the New, New Testament. New Testament is put together. Uh, it starts in 49, ends in about 95, Okay, they're writing all that time. So about 50 years it takes to write the, the New Testament, what we call the New Testament. All of Paul's letters, <coughs> the Gospels, Acts, uh, uh, Revelation, the general epistles, all take about 50 years to write. And, and uh, uh, what, what we have is 27 books. And those first 27 books 
are put together by a guy who are first acknowledged by uh, a gentleman named Athanasius. Athanasius is a huge uh, uh, leader in the church. He actually fought, if you would, uh, the argument of the nature of who Jesus Christ is. Whether or not Jesus is equal to the Son of, Son of God or similar to the Son, or uh, similar to God. Equal to God or similar to God. But Athanasius acknowledged that there were these 27 books uh, that were out there and began to utilize what Onesimus started to put together. Onesimus, the slave, and Philemon. Onesimus collects the letters of Paul and probably the Gospel of Luke and starts to put together a document or uh, a set of documents, a set of scrolls that begin to teach what Jesus Christ was teaching about and what Paul uh, was inspired about. So what we have is, is the Gospels, and how many Gospels are there? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew is uh, written second, Mark is first. Uh, Mark is written around 72, Matthew around 74, Luke around 76, and then John around 90. Then we have the history book, which is the book of Acts, written by Luke. Then we have the Pauline epistles, those letters that are attributed to Paul uh, and uh, plagiarized in the name of Paul. Not all those letters were written by Paul. And then you have the general epistles, where you have uh, James, Peter, John, Jude. And then you have the pro prophecy book of Revelation. Okay, and then for Presbyterians, we have on top of that, the foundational document is the book of, uh, is the Bible. Then on top of that, we have, as our inspiration, the Book of Confessions. That includes the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Scots Confession, the Heidelberg Confession, the Second Helvetic Confession, the Westminster Confession, the Shorter Catechism, Larger Catechism, the Barman Declaration, Confession in 1967, and then the Belhar Confession. Those are in almost date order, oldest to newest. Oh, uh, well, we just added the Belhar Confession. Yes, Belhar Confession is brand new uh, uh, two years ago. Yep. Yeah, last General Assembly, they voted to accept the Belhar Confession uh, as as one of our confessions. What what I find interesting in this is that we don't have a, any of Calvin's confessions. That we don't have any of Luther's confessions. Well, the Augsburg confession is not there. Uh, Calvin's confessions are not there. But well, uh, but we've got uh, you know we've got a lot of other. But these are in date kind of in date order. Uh, Barman Declaration being done uh, during Nazi Germany. It's, it's the church's answer to the nationalization of the Lutheran church in Nazi Germany and, and being declared the church of the state. And uh, a guy named Karl Barth writes that declaration uh, along with uh, a couple people that are pretty uh, pretty predominant. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is in attendance, uh, but uh, Karl Barth is the one that pens the document, and uh, it's quite a document. But what what they're doing is a group of leaders decide to say that uh, uh, the usurping of the church, the church does not belong to the state, the church belongs to God. And that's, I mean, that's, if you think about that, that is really 
important. It's it, when put into the hands of the state or the government, the church, who does it answer to? Yeah. Okay. It, it answers to the state. That Who should it be answering to? God. God. Does it, it, and, and the tenets of faith, the tenets that are, are the essential tenets and the doctrines are driven by God, uh, the Bible, the confessions, and our governments. But the government can't usurp the, the, the confessions. They can't usurp uh, the Bible. That's been done a couple times in history, uh, in the history of the church. Uh, and then the Belhar Confession is a, bel is a confession about racism uh, uh, originally drafted in the late 60s and si early 70s. Uh, it was used in the church uh, in uh, uh, Denmark, I believe, Belhar, and uh, it, it answered the question about apartheid and how the church acknowledges its role uh, in racism. So are there other confessions to answer the question? You bet. Could they come back to uh, this General Assembly and say, we think that uh, uh, the Augsburg Confession ought to be included in our book of confessions? And you'd have a bunch of people say, no, we can't do that. And another bunch of say, oh, I think that's a great idea. You know, confession of 1967, I think, got approved in, in uh, 1980. So it takes a while. Any questions about this? This, These are our governing documents other than the Book of Order. I, I will get you a copy of everything. Yes, and it also is on our uh, our site, the Canvas site. Okay, uh, I've talked about the Book of Order. Well, how do you change the Book of Order? What's that? You vote? I wish it was that easy. Oh boy. Well, it all starts with something that a member of the church or an elder. Come up, comes up with. All starts with a motion at session. And they define what we call an overture. And that overture then goes to the session. The session then looks at that overture, knowing that that overture may change the book of order. So you put your stamp on that you're asking for the Book of Order to be changed. Uh, some sessions will rebel against the Book of Order, and then a judicial committee will be established. They'll go to church court, and depending on what the church court says, they will write an overture if they don't agree with it and send it on off to presbytery. A lot of the controversial uh, overtures that, that have been made have come that way. Uh, ordination questions, uh, membership questions, um, social justice questions, um, those sort of things. Uh, uh, discipline questions, governing questions. Uh, so uh, the session then takes that overture and either votes yay or they vote nay. They vote nay, no, it's defeated. It either goes back to a session committee for rework or it goes back to the person that says, we're sorry, blah, blah, blah. They can resubmit it, changing it a little bit, and session takes it up again. If they say yes, it then goes to presbytery. Presbytery then takes that overture and they vote on it. They can say no and it's defeated or 
they can, they can say yes, or they, and this is normally what happens, they send it to committee. I didn't say this was going to be easy. They send it to the committee and or their commissioners. Remember we talked about those commissioners, all right? If it's a no, it goes back to the presbytery with no. Presbytery takes it, it's defeated, it goes back to the session, and then it goes ends up going back to the elder or the member that presented it. So it just reverses its, its chain. But uh, if they say yes, it then goes to the presbytery to vote. All right? The presbytery then has to vote. It's a simple majority. Okay? A hundred people, if it gets 51 votes, it goes along this nice little line that will be there, and it goes to General Assembly, actually goes to the stated clerk of the General Assembly. Uh, but the synod can do the same thing, okay? But it doesn't have the elders and overture. They can create their own overture. So the synod has equal power. So once, it, once Presbytery says yes and or the synod says yes on something, that overture is then sent to the stated clerk at least 120 days prior to the next General Assembly, which is held every other year, every two years. The, clerk, the stated clerk then sends it to an advisory commission on the Constitution, because the Book of, Book of Order is, a, is Constitution Part 2, or they can send it to the, uh, the General Assembly Committee that's in charge of that. If the General Assembly Committee says no, it goes back to the advisory committee, either to change it, rewrite it, or it gets sent back, all the way back. If they say yes, it goes back to the GA committee that gets added to the agenda for the General Assembly. The General Assembly then votes on it, all right, after discussion. Most of the time, it's the question is called, and they refer it back to the advisory committee. And the advisory committee then reworks it and talks about it to see how they, what they need to do to reword it so that it would be acceptable. And it goes back to the GA committee, and then the GA committee votes yay or nay with the changes, and then sends it back to the General Assembly for the vote. This is all happening in a two-week period. goes to the General Assembly and praise God, yes, it gets a yes, a majority vote. It says yes, and they send the overture as approved by the General Assembly to all the presbyteries. And the presbyteries have one year to say yay or nay. Again, simple majority. All the presbyteries then have to vote on it. Okay? If we get a simple majority, sometime within that year, the stated clerk is notified in writing that the motion has passed, the overture has passed. It then becomes the book of order. It go, gets added into the book of order. <laughs> it could be. <coughs> yes. Yes, they died. Uh, the, or, the ordination of, of gays and lesbians, homosexuals, the ordination, that discussion started in the 60s over the discussion of the Heidelberg Confession. It only became 
an overture because one of the committee members from uh, from the Netherlands had their book of confessions in their language, and they noticed that there was a word inserted into the Heidelberg Confession in English, homosexuality. Somebody inserted the word. Where'd it come from? They reworked the Heidelberg Confession, and the person that was reworking it added the word. Think of the controversy and mess up that's caused by that person doing that. They didn't change that, even though they knew that, until two general assemblies ago. Think about that. Forty years, they knew that word was wrong, that it was inserted. It still didn't get changed because of all the no's. So the Book of Order gets changed after the presbyteries in 12 months vote on it. If the General Assembly says no, it either gets tabled or it goes back to the committee. All right, if the presbyteries say no, it goes back to the General Assembly and generally gets sent back to the committee and tabled or they rework it for the next General Assembly or it just goes back and is defeated. All right, now, the Book of Confessions, on the other hand, is not a simple majority. The Book of Confessions requires two-thirds majority in each one of the presbyteries and all the presbyteries to change. So the Belhar Confession didn't make it the first time. It took two general assemblies to get the Belhar Confession approved into our, into our book. And that's how you change the Book of Order. I'll, I'll give you all copies of this. Any questions on that? <laughs> are you all confused? Are, are, are you asking yourselves, how in the world do we get anything done? Well, we call it de doing things decently and in order. So if it ends up in the book of order, boy, there's been a lot of vetting that's taken place, right? A lot of vetting. Look at all of those yes and no's. Oh, yes. Absolutely. The Holy Spirit. Whew, mm. This is, for me, This, if, if God wants it done, it'll get done. If God doesn't want it to get done, it's not going to get done. So does the Holy Spirit play a part in this? You betcha. You betcha. Well, we well well we we it, during Lent, uh, Tim and I changed the confession. Yeah, we just use we just use sections of it. Last year we used this uh, 1967 confession 1967. Every Sunday we took a portion of it. Okay, uh, but if you get the Westminster Confession, you could spend three years uh, doing it. So. Uh, for me, and, and on Communion Sunday, we're, we say the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I, we do that because the Book of Order tells us so. Okay? Uh, uh, th that's the common creed. All right? So if you're in Communion, we're in Communion, what, are we, what, are we, what happens to us? Lifted up into the presence of God. If we're all lifted up into the presence of God and we're saying 25 different confessions, well, who gets heard? We all get heard, but if we all say the same confession, right? The Apostles' Creed gets said at, at, at uh, communion and the Lord's Prayer. Now, I don't know why the, that has to be stipulated because the Lord's Prayer is supposed to be said all the time it's just a matter of where it falls in the service uh, at First Presbyterian your pastor likes to do it twice 
just because uh, he forgets? <laughs> oh, well. Uh, but, uh, uh, but those are the two things of communion you have, to, you have to do. Apostles' Creed and Lord's Prayer. You have. Uh, at, not at communion you haven't. It's, it's, uh, but uh, otherwise, it's really up to the pastor to pick the, pick the creed. Um, uh, the Nicene Creed could be used, but it uses some different language than we're used to. Very God of very God. Tell me what that means. Uh, I have trouble enough with the Holy Spirit, uh, about what the Holy Ghost, right? Yeah. Half the kids in the congregation go, we have ghosts? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, we, that, that, yeah, if you don't like the confessions, it's me, right? I pick the confessions, the prayers, the sermons, the text, that's me. Uh, uh, again, for Lent, we change that up. We change that up. We will do, I, I, Tim and I are still discussing what we're going to do for this Lent for the confession. We might do the Belhar confession, I don't know. That's the new one. Any questions about this? Any questions at all? All right. How many people know our symbol? Yeah, Tim certainly does. Jody certainly does. Did you know that we're one of the top 10 logos in the country? The top 10 logos in the country. You know, like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and IBM. Yeah. yeah. We're, ours is one of those logos. Yeah. Yeah, we've, ours is famous. Famous. Designed by Malcolm Greer and Associates. Uh, it, it, when, when we go through this, and you will see why. It is an amazing symbol. Thanks to Jody, it's really amazing. All right? It's, it's symbolic of the affirmation of our legacy, of our history, what our mission is, what our liturgy is, and what we believe without even saying a word. Without even saying a word. The symbol is our confession of faith. The first emblem that you see is the cross. You see the cross? For me, it's easy. Just cover up the right eye. Everything's blurred. So the cross, that's the dominant structure. It's the dominant piece. It's the dominant picture. And it's the dominant theological element of Christianity, the cross, the cross. Uh, it represents a number of things, the incarnate love of God and Jesus Christ, his passion, and his resurrection. Why do we say it represents the resurrection? Because it's empty, right? It's, he's not there. Then above the cross... This pretty, for me, this is part of the really slick part of the of the of the uh, logo. We look at the cross a little bit closer. We see that upper portion transforms into the shape of a dove. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's descending upon Jesus Christ in the form of a dove. But within that dove is a fish. In, in, in the middle of that dove is a fish. I, when I looked at that symbol the first time, I thought, boy, what a crazy-looking dove that is, until I was told, yeah, but it's not. It's a fish. You know, think about, think about what that fish means. Feeding the 5,000, the loaves and bread are getting ready for communion. Uh, it reminds us also of our mission statement, to feed the hungry and to be servants of those that are in need. The next thing that we see is God's holy word. The Old Testament and the New Testament. 
the shape of an open book on the Bible. Our book is not closed. Our book is open because it's alive. And it becomes alive when that book opens. It's simply a book if it's closed like it is on the table. If it's on the, on the table right there, all those closed Bibles, simply a book until you open it up. And what happens? The Holy Spirit takes over, and when you read the words, they're enlivened. How in the world do we get all those confessions? How have we changed over the years? It's because the Word lives. The Holy Spirit talks to us. God talks to us when we open that book. The opening of the book, uh, lifelong Roman Catholics. Do you open your Bible at home? Did you? No. You didn't open that Bible. Why? The only person who really should be able to open that Bible was the <coughs> priest or the diaconate <coughs> or whatever it was that was assigned to open up that, that word. It was the Word of God. And the only people that were allowed to read the Word of God and open the Bible of the Word of God were the priests. So the open Bible that Luther talks about, that everybody should be able to read the Bible in their own language, wow, that's a radical thing. We just take it for granted. When the pastor comes by, you throw the Bible on the coffee table. You really want to impress the pastor, open the Bible up. All right, but, but it, it tells us the role that Scripture plays for us, both the Old and the New Testaments. Both the Old and the New Testaments. That is the Word of God. But also the Word of God is the Word spoken. And what we have is the pulpit. What we have is the pulpit, the spoken word of God. You have the written word of God, and you have the spoken word of God, that the church is called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ for the salvation of humankind. Do you see, do you see the pulpit? Do you see a what? A robe. A robe. Ooh. 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 Oh. <laughs> you are right. That's 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 great. That's great. What do you see? The vessel? Okay, uh, well, that, okay. L looking closer at the design, uh, we're going to talk about those vessels, all right? Uh, the, the, the table, uh, the, the two sacraments. We've got the baptismal font, okay? Baptismal font there. And then we've got the cup. You see the cup? Yes. Okay. And the table was right underneath the Bible, and that's what you put the Bible on was the table. All right? And the cup of communion. Again, I thought pretty. that's a pretty slick element of that. But, yes, uh, you know, I, I, you, the visuals are amazing. Yeah. I never saw the robe. Wow. I don't think anybody said that. I'm going to write. I'm going to write. Yeah. How did you find that? I covered my right eye. Uh, and then, and then after that, there, you know, the very prominent things that you see in this are certainly the flames, reflecting the double sign, the Old Testament when when God spoke to Moses, and Pentecost. 
okay? The flame of God talking to Moses and the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles at Pentecost to spread the good news of the gospel. And then, for all you mathematicians, the triangle. The triangle, the trinity, is at the heart. The heart of the uh, symbol uh, shows the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it also suggests the order of our government, of a balanced government, the difference between that it's balanced between lay people and ordained people, that it represents our governing bodies. So do you see that? I think that's pretty slick. And that's our, that's our symbol as it is right there. Watch this. Ooh. All right, Jody. Way to go. Jody, Jody spent days putting that together. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, but, but that's one of the top ten logos in the country. Pretty slick. Pretty slick. And you just look at it, uh, you know, and all of a sudden you start to find all those things, including the robe. Uh, it started in 1980, in the 80s. Uh, we, we hired uh, an advertising agency to come up with a logo for the uh, church that was going to be united, the Northern and Southern Church, uh, in 1986, and we needed a logo. Yes. And so this is the logo that came out. What was it before that? It was a circle, yeah. It was a circle, PCU, uh, Presbyterian Church of America and United Presbyterian Church of the United States. And it was, it was a circle with the words around it and uh, a cross. Yes. The P, no, no. The, no, no, only the PCUSA. No, no, this is the PCUSA's symbol. It's copyrighted. Can't be used by anybody else. Only the PCUSA. Only the PCA. PCA has something different, and EPC has something different. They would love to get their hands on that. But that, that, that is our symbol. It's a theology unto itself. Theology unto itself. No. I think they're divided for a very long time. If you have a group of people that say it's not okay to ordain women uh, and use it as a, and use the Bible as the basis for that, I don't I don't see us coming back together at least in my lifetime. Of course, that might be short. Who knows? Uh, but uh, uh, I do, I don't see it. I don't see that happening. Uh, I don't see uh, the EPC would be the only one that could come, but, but that would take some major doing because the churches actually dissolved their, their uh, membership of the PCUSA. They dissolved the constitutions and accepted the tenets of those, those churches, that denomination, to, to renounce that and come back, that's going to take a long time. It, it took us it took us a hundred years to bring the Northern Church and Southern Church together again. Though we believed in essentially everything everything the same. So, any other questions? Any questions about this? Peace USA is the biggest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In what regard? Oh, you, you mean ordaining them? Uh, well, they can. The, the PCUSA said you can vote your conscience. 
uh, as as the pastor can vote his their, their conscience. If the se the session remember the session controls everything, but the worship service belongs to the pastor. Okay, if the pastor says I would ordain or I would I would I would uh, uh, permit ordination. I, I would do an ordination of anyone that's homosexual, and the session would say no. There would be some problems. Uh, if a marriage, for instance, if we were to do a marriage, session has to approve use of building. Pastor has to approve doing the marriage, but at the vote of conscience. The session could say, Pastor, we want you to do that. And the pastor can say, no, I don't believe that that is in my wheelhouse. Or conversely, the same thing can be, be the same thing. Uh, that church, that church actually, we could press it because it's not adopting the essential tenets. Uh, if, if it's done that we don't believe this should happen. The individual session can say, no, no, you can't. And the pastor says, eh, but we need to be able to play in the same sandbox together. Peace USA has done that to allow us that, that thing. But if they're adamant about it uh, without discussion, there may be, they, they, may, they would be and could be asked to leave the denomination. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. All right, we've got 10 minutes, and I'm going to start uh, what I would call my worship and sacraments class. This is the class that I taught uh, for uh, the uh, lay people that were going to be uh, certified lay people. This is this is the if for for us right at this point. This is going to be your seminary level class, okay? This is the worship and sacraments class. Do we have this yet? You do not have this yet. Nope. I will get you all of these slides, or you can go to Canvas. Okay. This is the wor worship and sacraments class. I'm going to talk about worship first going to talk about worship first, uh, what, the, what the background of worship is, how we shape the worship service, uh, what the power of the voice is, what the symbolisms are, what our gestures are, how we pick hymns, and how we lead worship. All those things, you know, go into the Presbyterian worship service. Some people will say, why do you have, why can't we do the offering at the beginning of the worship service? Why do you think we don't do that? Why do we take the offering after the sermon? A response. It's a call and a response. A response to God's word. All right? What if they don't like the word? What's that? Too bad. That's right. That's right. Well, go with it, Tim. All right. <laughs> do they give the money? That's the problem. Do you give the money up front, or do you do it at the very end of the worship service? Always been a touchy thing, but in the Reformed tradition, generally, the offering is taken after the word. Okay. And notice we insert a confession just just before that. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now I invite the ushers to come forward. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, majority of the churches still use the plate. But I mean our church. Oh, our church. Uh, the majority of money still comes in via the plate, via check. Okay? But that, that has changed dramatically over the last couple years uh, where the electronic checks 
not the handwritten ones. The electronic checks come in where you go into your accounts, program it, and it, pew, it just just like you're paying an insurance bill. You pay, you pay the church that way. But it comes in as a form of a check. We still have cash. But the, the, the weight is, is shifting. Uh, texting to give, uh, using the credit card reader, um, uh, that sort of thing. The best way, if, if you're not going to write one of those electronic checks, uh, is to give via Facebook. There's no cost. All the other things, there's a little fee that gets gets tacked onto it. Uh, but it'll give you, in our text to give, it'll ask if you want to pay that difference. So, uh, yes, yeah. Through the you you set up you set up your bank account uh, to send it out or. You've signed a thing called a draft, right. a, a bank draft, and allows the church for that year to take money out of your account. So uh, you say you can take out of my account a thousand bucks a month, right. uh, every month, and we present that draft to the bank just like a check. Okay, uh, but but we, yeah, there's a bank draft, and then there's an electronic check that you send, you control when it gets sent. Okay? Yes? And they had the option to buy the place at the back of the church. Sure. And you go in on it. Or you leave. Sure, sure. Yeah, that... Uh, Yes, a lot of the non-denominational churches, uh, some of the Baptist churches, uh, they'll they'll have the plate in the back, and they won't be passing the plate. That's not part of their liturgy, that's not part of their worship piece. Okay, so what we're going to do, I think we're going to I think we're going to stop here, because the rest of this starts to really dive into our worship, of why we worship. What's worship about? Why we use the scriptures that we do, and the and the uh, uh, book of order, how it directs us, because there's a worship section in the book of order that drives our worship, okay? And then how it uh, uh, fits in with reformed worship, the reformed worship, the marks of the church, who leads the worship, who can do the sacraments. Um, who can do funerals? Uh, uh, who here could? Uh, who thinks that I'm only one, the only one that can do a funeral? In fact, you all can do the funeral. You don't need me. You don't need me to do the funeral. It might be helpful, but you can do the funeral. It, why? Because it's not a sacrament. Could you do the marriage? Okay, why not? Why couldn't you do the marriage? What's that? No, you're not registered with the state. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you have to. You could. You could be a commissioner like James. James was able to do weddings because he was certified to, by the state to do them. Okay, so you could. He could do them. Sure, sure. It depends on what the state, what the, what those requirements are. Oh no, you can no. It's because it's not a sacrament, all right? If the session says yes, right? If the session says yes, you can do it. Yeah, that's session, doggone session. All right, all right. Let's, uh, let's pray. Gracious God, we give you great thanks that you have come upon us. You have let your spirit activate in us, enliven us. And we pray, Lord, that our ears have been opened, our minds have been opened, our eyes have been opened. But mostly, Lord, we pray that our hearts have been opened to the understanding of the mechanics of what you call us to do. May you be with these folks as they leave this place. May they reflect your face in all that they say, all that they do, and all that they are. For they are your representatives. They are your ministers. 
in and outside the four walls of this church because they are called Christian. And it's in your son's name that we do all things.